If there was an abnormality in a single beat or a single lead of an ECG, would you be able to make a diagnosis using the information from that complex alone? You can if you know the DD-based approach to abnormalities in ECG deflections. Hello and welcome to Practical ECG Courses. My name is Obed and I am an emergency physician working in the UK. Today I will discuss a practical DD-based approach to abnormal ECG deflections. I will cover 10 common ECG deflection abnormalities. Inverted P wave has two important DDs, low atrial rhythm and junctional rhythm. The point of differentiation here is the PR interval. If the PR interval is normal, that is suggestive of a low atrial rhythm. As you can see here, it is around four small boxes. And if you have a short PR interval, that is suggestive of a junctional rhythm. As you can see here, it's around two small boxes. If you want to know the concepts behind inverted P waves, I've done a talk about it earlier. You can see a link to that talk here. Absent P wave occurs when there is no atrial depolarization. As the P wave is absent, we have to depend on other findings in the ECG to diagnose the underlying condition. There are three important causes for absent P waves. If there is an irregularly irregular narrow complex tachycardia without any discrete P waves, consider AF. In AF, the atria only fibrillates and therefore there is no proper atrial depolarization. If there is a tall peak T waves, consider hyperkalemia. In hyperkalemia, there is an electrical atrial paralysis which results in absent P waves. If there is a sinus rhythm with a sudden pause which has no arithmetical relationship to the basic sinus rate, then consider a sinus pause or a sinus arrest. Hidden P waves are different from absent P waves. Remember, in absent P waves, there is no atrial depolarization. But in hidden P waves, there is atrial depolarization, but it occurs at the same time as the ventricular depolarization and therefore it is hidden within the QRS complex. As a result, there is no visible P waves on the ECG. The two important DDs for hidden P waves are SVT and junctional rhythm. Again, to diagnose these conditions, you have to look at the other findings on the ECG. If there is a regular narrow complex tachycardia, consider SVT. If there is a narrow complex rhythm with a rate between 40 to 60, consider a junctional rhythm. There are three important DDs for a short PR interval, WPW, LGL and junctional rhythm. The point of differentiation here is the P wave and the delta wave. Look for whether the P wave is upright or inverted and whether the delta wave is present or not. If the P wave is upright and there is a delta wave, consider WPW. If the P wave is upright and there is no delta wave, consider LGL. If the P wave is inverted and there is no delta wave, consider a junctional rhythm. For pathological Q waves, there are two important DDs, MI and HCM. The point of differentiation is the width of the Q wave. If the width of the Q wave is less than 40 milliseconds or one small box, it is suggestive of HCM. If the width of the Q wave is 40 milliseconds or more, it is suggestive of MI. Q waves should normally be seen in the lateral leads, especially in V5 and V6. Loss of normal Q waves has two important DDs, LBBB and LVH. The point of differentiation here is the QRS complex. If the QRS is wide, that is 120 milliseconds or more, consider LBBB. If the QRS is tall, consider LVH. Normally, there is a gradual progression in the height of the R wave from V1 to V6. This means that V1 has the smallest R wave. So, tall R waves in V1 is abnormal. The four important DDs of tall R wave in V1 are WPW, posterior wall MI, RVH and RBBB. If there is a short PR interval, delta wave and a wide QRS, consider WPW. If there is a horizontal ST segment depression with an upright T wave, consider posterior wall MI. If the height of the R wave is more than 6 mm and the QRS is narrow, consider RVH. If the QRS is wide and then there is an RSR prime, consider RBBB. The two important DDs for tall T waves are hyperkalemia and hyperacute T waves of ischemia. The point of differentiation is the morphology of the T wave. Look at the apex as well as the base of the T wave. If the T wave has a peaked or pointy apex and a narrow base, consider hyperkalemia. If the T wave has a relatively blunt apex and a wide base, consider hyperacute T waves of ischemia. There are two important DDs for T wave inversions, ischemia and LVH. 
There are three points of differentiation based on the T wave morphology. If the T wave is symmetrical, deep, and has a pointy tip, it is more likely to be ischemia. If the T wave is asymmetrical, shallow, and has a blunted tip, it is more likely to be due to LVH. These points can also be used to differentiate ischemic T wave inversion from T wave inversions due to secondary repolarization abnormalities like LBBB, RBBB, RBH, etc. The two DDs for biphasic T waves are Wellen syndrome and hypokalemia. The differentiation is based on the morphology of the T wave and the QT interval. If the T wave has an initial positivity with a subsequent negativity, consider Wellen syndrome. If the T wave has an initial negativity with a subsequent positivity, consider hypokalemia. In addition, the QT interval is generally normal in Wellens, whereas it is long in hypokalemia. Thank you for watching. If you found this useful, please like the video, subscribe to my channel, and click on the bell icon so that you do not miss out on any of the teaching. If you are interested in learning ECGs, especially if you wish to understand the concepts behind ECG interpretation, then watch the other videos on my YouTube channel or on my website. Alternatively, you can also attend the free online ECG teaching that I conduct every couple of months. I will leave the links in the description box below. Bye for now.